more will be added. I agree. Because they, and, and I think, you know, I, I just think, and, and some of these women's, you know, their, maybe their husbands or their children or their sister-in-laws or their brother-in-laws are going to say, oh, come on, they really didn't do that. Well, here I'm coming too. Exactly. I think, I do, th I, I, well, how many years have we been doing this together? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we've seen how people respond mm -hmm. and this I think the, the the more the more ridiculous it gets the more they they do seem to respond and I think that um, there are many uh, proof points in how Missouri women and people other Missourians who support women stand up and make their voice heard when people are disrespecting women's reproductive health I think there's a, a someone who ran for Senate, who um, made some egregious remarks about how women's bodies operate, someone else displaying the kind of insensitivity to how women who ran for U.S. Senate um, last year, and he is not our senator. Our senator oh, is Senator Claire McCaskill, who has been working her, you know, what off to protect women's health um, and all sorts of women's issues, whether it's um, uh, violence in the military or on campus. She's really standing up for women, and that's the kind of woman or the kind of elected official that uh, Missourians will elect. And so I think that not only are more people going to get involved here and now, um, talking to the House, talking to the governor about the veto, talking to the legislature, which is in September of an election year, right. uh, during a uh, potential override i think we're watching as part of what right. we're saying here well and and I, I, I you know women in missouri are watching women around the country are watching there's and there's elections this fall and then there's 2015 where women will be watching is missouri going to do something stupid again then there's 2016 which is a huge election where women's women will be watching women will be watching states like missouri where they can't rely on the state government to protect their rights on health care and that's something I, you know what I, women what women get, even women who may not ever choose to have an abortion themselves I find they get it because this is about health care it's about the decisions you make on how to to not have a pregnancy you don't want to, to have family planning to have contraception how to be healthy uh, for when you uh, decide you want to start having a family or you know can you know can have another child there's a, uh, it's all about making sure that women um, the have have good health care good good uh, uh, nutrition uh, care for sexually transmitted infections we need to you know it, it, it's it's the total picture and their partners are often involved too I mean this is all this is about reproductive health and women and their partners making decisions about that period in their lives when they may choose to have children or not have children and women get it and I think they're getting more and more that they're losing out on this and, and their ability to have the opportunity to make decisions for their own good is getting tightened down, tightened down, tightened down, and the decisions are being made for it. And I think what you said about that really resonates with me about how uh, it's not just women in Missouri who are standing up here 72 hours and taking action, but women across the country are watching states like Missouri and looking to elected officials to sort of snap out of it or surface those stars like Wendy right. Davis in right. Texas who right. really show that they can be a champion for women's health by using the political process to stand up and protect women's health. And I think we are coming to that moment here in Missouri where we have an opportunity to really, and the rest of the country has an opportunity to see an elected official in Missouri, our governor, step in and stand up for women's health. Like he has stepped in and really pushed for Medicaid expansion, he's really stood for Missourians' health. 300,000 working Missourians who can get access to health care if the people in that building would simply pass Medicaid expansion. That that our governor has been a real advocate 
of our health uh, and women's health. Medicaid is a very important program for women, and, and I think if this bill, which we think it will, lands on his desk, is an opportunity to show not just Missourians but the rest of the country that when the chips right. are down, Missouri and Missouri will come through for the women. Yes. I, I absolutely, I think it's you know it's an it's an incredible opportunity. And yes, women across the country are women, and, and anybody who cares about personal privacy rights and health care rights, you yeah. watching. So yeah, it's a it's a huge opportunity for Missouri. It's a it's a it, you know to be to be seen as a as a place where where women are not insulted, you know, uh, dismissed, disparaged. You know, it's it's a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for Missouri, and that's what we need to look at it as an opportunity. And speaking of that, and your comments about how. Um, Reproductive health is about so many things, um, not just a decision about what to do when faced with a pregnancy, it's about staying healthy and keeping healthy, and I think um, some of the bills you sponsored while you were in the legislature really were inspiring and, and did create an opportunity to um, talk about and show some politicians um, and the rest of us what good solid policy around reproductive mm. health, where does the government belong in uh, productive, smart uh, public policy when it comes to that. I don't know if you recall any of those bills. Oh, our prevention first. <laughs> oh, yeah? Maybe yeah. we can talk right. a little bit exactly. about what yeah. was in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so, uh, so basic is, you know, if you don't want un unintended pregnancies, prevent them. This is 2014, we have multiple ways of preventing pregnancy. And um, we tried for years, and I know it still goes on in the Capitol today, uh, to, 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 for Missouri to have sound public policy that enables women to prevent unwanted pregnancies. Um, so, that, so that bill um, allowed you know, guaranteed access to uh, family planning services. Uh, it would have uh, uh, codified the ability to get birth control in law. Um, it had a sex education component. Um, and it had uh, access to, to birth control for women who, you know, might not be able to afford it. Um, and you know, we're talking about uh, Medicaid expansion. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, we have we have some access to, to women's health care um, through the Medicaid model, but but it's not all about women, as we know that men are included in reproductive decisions. So um, that you know that that um, that bill had uh, had access to. Uh, Access to uh, to family planning services. I'm trying to think what else. I we think there was, was one other what, yeah, piece yeah, where trying to ensure that women who um, go to the emergency room, that's right, as a result of rape, yes, that they exactly. were get information about, about emergency, emergency contraception. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. And so we were just uh, talking about how the Senate um, decided to impose this extra triple mandatory delay on survivors of rape. They have an opportunity to protect those women they didn't. Right. Um, but here your bill would have helped women who presented at the emergency room get emergency contraception so they wouldn't be in a situation with an unintended pregnancy right. as a result exactly. of a rape. That's right. And Again, we're talking about preventing pregnancies that, that you know, from proceeding that, that in, in these extreme circumstances of rape and rape incest, you know, who can't support that? And this crowd. Oh uh, well, and I know a lot of people just assume that that's the standard of care. <laughs> that's what the American Medical Association recommends. I I think the Hospital Association too. That's a standard practice to give a survivor of rape in the hospital access or information about emergency contraception. But you proposed your bill because not right. happening. It's not happening. Not happening. Not happening. Absolutely. And that that is. Oh, I don't know. Keep, it's, you know, the word cruel should stand on its own, but when you think about how, 
how we, you know, how this tears up, tears up people's lives, and yet, and could be prevented. I mean, women's lives, this, 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 um, this you know, tearing up of their lives, this uh, total, um, you know, when a woman's been raped, the cruelest thing that can happen to her is to have to carry that pregnancy to term. She doesn't want to. And, and, and for, that's so basic. And for these guys in here to not understand that and to not keep that from happening, it's unfathomable to me. But uh, yeah, we, we, we've been, we, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of good legislators, mostly women, have championed those causes over the years. And it never has the prevention, the preven the prevention part. Yeah, I'm back and forth. The prevention part of reproductive health care um, has never. Missouri lawmakers have never um, you know, realized that that's the way to do it. And you know what, maybe <laughs> what used to just stun me the first time it happened, early on, was how all the anti-women's health care lobbyists would line up to sit down and actually oppose contraception. So, you know, when we talk with candidates about running for the legislature, they'd say, well, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, just, I don't know, I can't support abortion. Do you understand that by lining up by saying that just absolute and lining up with the other side, you are also opposing birth control. And they just they wouldn't they just hardly believe it. That's the way it is in Missouri. The opposition is from basic birth control. All the way, you know. All, all the, the gamut of women's health women's unique health care issues are all opposed. I remember having to explain that to whether it's people interested in running or just people who aren't from Missouri or used to the politics to say that the folks who are the leading the fight, um, the anti-women's health lobby, absolutely equate birth control with abortion. And if right. you listen carefully, if you happen to hear the House debate on um, abortion today or listen to the, the political debate in Missouri about um, reproductive health, listen carefully because when those uh, forces are talking about abortion, they are often including birth control, certainly emergency contraception, hormonal birth control, they're including mm -hmm. it. And I remember too that even Governor Holden was a little surprised when he ha passed the Women's Health Initiative mm -hmm. that was requiring um, insurance coverage for contraceptives way back right, right, when right. that um, he thought he he had a whole group yeah. of people who worked on health, including those opposed to it, sit down and talk about what that should look like. And immediately the anti-women's health people said, well, you have to define contraception to exclude birth control. <laughs> like every, everything women use. And, uh, I think uh, in that meeting there was a legislator who was a nurse and typically worked with those anti-women's health people on the issue of abortion who was a little surprised <laughs> to hear that definition of contraception was limited, uh -huh. excluded birth control, uh, oral contraception. So yes, that is something to watch for in Missouri. And, um, and I think, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, because we have the restrictions in Missouri um, that we've had to turn to the federal law, yes. the Affordable Care Act has been a great advance for Missouri women's right. access to health care with the, um, the birth control benefits. So when you're paying your insurance premiums, those include um, your birth control. You no longer have to pay extra co-pays for them. So that's a benefit right. that, that we've had to rely on the federal government for because the Missouri legislature not so much. Well, it, it really does show what an outlier Missouri is, that the federal law gets it and provides it. Right. And, and yet in Missouri, they're still saying, oh, no, 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 we can't, we can't do anything to help women prevent unwanted, you know, unintended pregnancies. So, 
Yeah. That's and in fact, right. we had a big battle about that in 2012. Um, right. uh, actually, the legislator who succeeded you in your seat um, passed a bill that would, in Missouri, prohibit right. Uh, or allow employers to deny coverage for birth control for their employees if they didn't like birth control. So it was the, right. the boss can deny your right. birth control bill. And now that's again where Governor Nixon really showed his ability to stand up for women's health. He vetoed that bill um, and we tried really hard to sustain it. came very close uh, and um, he was overridden but he was able to make it work as a champion for women's health. And, right. I think women, now that they don't have to go to their boss's office to right. talk about their birth control prescription and get permission to get that covered, they can appreciate his efforts um, and yep. those of the, the elected officials at the federal level. And I, that that bill was, uh, or that law was uh, ruled, uh, federal law takes precedent. Exactly. Right? So, so, so it didn't succeed in the end. Right. The courts had the, to The court, the, had to go, go to court and... Uh, they have to say, you know what, federal law supersedes Missouri law on these issues that the federal that federal law has spoken on. So yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a constant struggle here in Missouri to uh, try to represent the interests of uh, of women and 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 families and partners. And, you know, it's a it's a tough time, but uh, you know this. Uh, the people who care about this, okay, I, I'm convinced this 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 sad day will not be the end of the story. <laughs> no, Thank as goodness. we mentioned before, Thank yeah, goodness. there's all sorts of Missourians, not just the ones inside the building, yeah, right. and we're going to rely on the ones right. outside the building that right. will help stand up for women's health and. Yeah, this legislature will um, adjourn and. Well, Friday, this is Tuesday, three and a half more days, and uh, they'll go home, and I think they'll be hearing about this from their folks at home, that uh, this is not a very uh, smart thing to do, and um, we know, we, sure, they'll be hearing about it. <laughs> and there are lots of ways people it's, can take action. It's so easy, right. remember? Yeah. When we had to fax everything to each other? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> We're dating yeah. ourselves. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> but that technology has moved really fast, too. <laughs> go to a desk to yes. call someone. Right, exactly. And now you just press a button right. and you can let your elected official know. That's right. You can do something like we're doing here, or get your voice out in front of the whole world through the mm -hmm. live stream. I think even on this site where you're watching it, there's a petition, you can just fill in your name oh, and address good. and oh, good. hit send and boom, it goes to the legislature and will go to the governor. And okay. I think lots and good. lots of groups will be trying to make it really, really easy for people to weigh in. Um, what we're doing here isn't so easy talking 72 hours in a row, standing up for women's health. Um, and that's not so easy, but we have to do it all. We have to do right. the hard Everything. stuff. Every and and everybody has a role to play. Right. Uh, people who, who want to stand up and talk, people who want to sit at their keyboard and send messages and sign petitions and get people educated, people who want to go down to the coffee shop and lie and wait for that legislator to walk in the door, that's, that works too. Yes, um, tell me, now when you were senator, what did you think were some of the most effective and impactful ways uh, Missourians weighed in with you? Well, it's always those personal contacts. It's, it is the personal contacts that that make that uh, that, that have the biggest impact and the personal stories. So we need to have the the volume of emails and messages and phone calls, but we need to have people getting their personal story to to their legislature. Too often they can say, well, no, never happened in my district, you know, and I don't know anybody that that's happened to. Well, unfortunately, and I understand it totally, um, one's reproductive life is pretty personal, and it's very difficult, very difficult, to talk about the problems you've had and the disappointments and the heartaches and reliving by having to tell the story. And I applaud. The, the women who have, oh my gosh, they are the heroes of this whole thing. 
the uh, you know, the women who will come testify, and then the news media picks it up, and, and um, but it's most felt helpful for those stories to come to each legislator from someone in their district, someone that they can run into on the street, somebody who their neighbors know if they don't know themselves. Okay? It's so it is the the personal stories. That's it. You know, but uh, but all these other efforts have to be made as well, because they can say, "Oh, that's one person." No, no. It's being echoed around. Yeah, it's got to be echoed around. You mentioned that you're running into uh, a legislator in a coffee shop. I think people who don't come here and see or interact with politicians sometimes think they are in a bubble and they are in, you know, mm. Congress or mm. in the legislature, mm. and then mm. they're they're floating around who knows where, but maybe you can talk about where and how you went interacted with constituents and where they could find you. Oh, yeah. Well, um, and of course every legislator is different and has their own, you know, habits and style, but, but you know, if you're going to get reelected, you got to get out and meet people and talk to people. So, so uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, going to the places where people are and you'll, you'll find your legislator and and you know in the summertime there's lots of uh, you know picnics and parades and outdoor stuff where legislators do go and um, and if they go they know they're, they they got to know they're going to get stopped along the way and and somebody's going to talk to them about some issue that makes a difference in their life and uh, I think that that's that's what people have to do is is these are just just people. I mean, they're just you know they were your they're the neighbor. They're you know they're it's they're ap absolutely approachable. Should be approached because um, they're responsible to their constituents and and uh, uh, it's and it's the responsibility of the constituents to approach them and to tell them and to, and to give them feedback on on um, how they see them doing their job and how it affects their lives. But to let you know to let legislators know. How, how their how their actions impact your life is is extremely important. So you mentioned that I think it's such a simple equation, but sort of an aha moment that elected officials need to get elected, and so when they're at home, they go where people are gathered. It's mm -hmm. more efficient if there's lots of people there yes. or more than one. Um, so. Uh, people who are interacting with their community group, they can invite a legislator, right? And absolutely. Say, oh, I have a group that oh, wants absolutely. to hear about this. Absolutely. That's what, you know, that's what the, it should be happening. Uh, yeah, and especially in these rural areas where um, the legislators are more visible. You know, I'm from an urban area. I could walk down the street and, you know, know back here or whatever. And that, you know, I like so, seeing you. Well, I know it's great, always great to run into you. So, no, it's, no, it's it's it is a, it is a little bit different where there's like in urban areas there's so many more legislators uh, and you know it's hard to keep track of who they are and sometimes who they who they if they represent you or not. But in these uh, um, in these rural areas uh, where people do need to. Uh, uh, they're they're much they're they're more they're, they're much more visible, uh, and that's why and they need to be approached and 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 visited with and invited in to to the neighborhood uh, picnic or the you know to, to get to hear feedback. That's but you know I think folks have to become much more activist and and um, uh, you know reaching out to the legislators to to, to talk to them and it's, you know it. Uh, uh, it, it's a it's, it's a part of being democracy, and uh, maybe we're a little rusty on that part. And it's got to get it's got to get going again because they're, uh, you know, you pull this issue in an, with with understanding and, and facts and stuff. Uh, folks don't like this. <laughs> this is not what no. This isn't what this isn't what people have in mind. The, the the government should be doing. It shouldn't be intruding in medical decisions, personal decisions. You know, life-changing decisions um, shouldn't be shouldn't be there. So, um, you know, legislators need to hear that. And I have a, a good story about that. Even just from last week, um, there's a legislator in Southwest Missouri that um, some 
folks who have been coming to Jefferson City several times over the course of this legislative session, um, both here under the dome and back at home were having difficulty reaching their elected officials. They were never in their office or not available when they would have driven all this way to come here and they were having difficulty setting appointments to even see them at home at a gathering. And so finally, one of the folks who had been trying wrote a letter to the editor of the local newspaper and basically explained how uh, frustrating this was that they couldn't get to meet with their elected official and the newspaper forwarded that to the elected official and it so happened that we were having a lobby day the next day and they had an appointment <laughs> and they had a meeting really? and so it worked oh, writing that that's, letter well, that's 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 terrific it, it shouldn't have to get to that point one would hope not one would hope not but uh, you know uh, this could we could go in a lot of directions on this about the you know the uh, uh, the comfort level some people get in their in their districts and don't feel like they have to, to fight to fight to remain here and redistricting and all kinds of things like that. But it, it is the responsibility of the constituency to remind them that they have, that they are accountable to them, and that's terrific that somebody is that persistent. That's I like that story. Yes, hopefully. maybe maybe I, I would hope it would change their behavior for the long term. I don't want to get to that situation again. I'll be more responsive. I think so. I think so. I think the, the subsequent calls and attempts to have meetings will be easier going yes, forward. Yes, exactly. Maybe that person will tell his or her buddies that, you know, don't let this happen to you. Go ahead and respond. And I don't know if it was an office slip up. He was very apologetic when oh, they met. Yeah, very course. polite. Sure. So yeah, well, um, it was a fine and great meeting yeah, to have. Good. Didn't get his vote, but he heard their voice. Well, that's good. That's really that's that's good to hear that uh, that persistence. And I, I do believe that we will um, that those kinds of things are going to be happening more and more. That this that this this issue, this bill, is is going to mobilize people over the coming months. Um, we, we're are virtually positive that this bill will, will pass today. And that's what we heard. Yeah from the house and we'll go to the governor and he will have until the middle of july um there's, there, there's a calculation 45 days or it something yeah days. and so whether that's july 13th or 14th or something like that to make his decision about the bill so that's going to be those uh, six weeks of activity well seven weeks of activity because it'll start today <laughs> Uh, to to uh, to for him to to give him the sense of of the the uh, the size of the uh, and the uh, intensity of the uh, the people who think this is uh, this uh, this intrusion this cruelty is not very Missouri like and uh, yeah in the next six to seven weeks it's going to be uh, there'll be uh, you know, ratcheting it up activity about this uh, focused on the governor uh, and then we have every you know reason to hope that he will veto it and then and then we'll let there'll be a swivel to the you know pivot to this to the um, to the uh, members of the house and the senate and now they have to meet so they set a time if the, if the governor vetoes in July mm -hmm. and then um, how does that work with does this veto just there is a veto session in September in the, in the middle of September after it's set, I guess the, the Tuesday after the second Monday or something you know one of those crazy things um, and uh, the, it happens no matter what the <laughs> no. session the session the veto session happens and did it's they, re, they have to they have to meet at least I think one day okay so um, and that's when, assuming the governor vetoes, then that's when, in mid-September, the legislature will return to the Capitol um, and the decision will be made whether or not to, to make a motion. Um, this is a uh, House bill? Yeah, it's a House bill. So the, the first motion will come in the House to, if, if, you know, if Norman decides to make a motion to override 
So it's not veto. automatic that it every is, bill that gets vetoed, no, they it is not on? automatic. Okay. Not automatic. Somebody has to make the motion to override. So there's veto bills that nothing happens. They don't get brought up. And we would hope that would be the case here. Well, let's make our voices heard. Absolutely. We don't want to yield to a fellow Missouri. We will yield to a yes. fellow Missouri. Yes. to adulthood can be difficult and painful for both boys and girls. Contrary to what we as parents seem to want to believe, the high school years are not always a carefree culmination of ideal, idyllic childhood. The paradox of the teens is that teens need both roots and wings. The, the things that make adults crazy, risk-taking behavior, all kinds of experimentation, questioning author, authority, rebellion, can place teens in harm's way but that are absolutely necessary to their development as independent adults. They desperately need the roots to our, of our values and boundaries, yet we sabotage our ability to help steer young people through the storm and provide safe harbor when our approach is too moralistic or inflexible. I want to talk to a psychiatrist because there are just some things I can't tell my parents, but I want adult help from somewhere. My parents wanted to know why I couldn't just talk to them. Well, I did talk to them and I told them I was gay, and then I had a girlfriend, and now my dad's my dad thinks it's a big joke, and he laughs about it all the time. It hurts. Sandy, age 16. I am on this endless path to finding who I am, what I am, who or what I can be in life. If I get my feelings go, if I let my feelings go to my so-called friends of mine, would they shy away? I bet they'd give me the silent treatment that can kill a person from the inside out. So I guess I'll just sit here in doubt. I guess I'm just scared of me. Calling me age 15. And parents are scared too, of saying too little or too much, or sending the wrong messages. How can parents trust that the lessons of the early years will eventually prevail, and their children will emerge intact on the other side of adolescence? How can they remain involved in their children's lives in ways that will help teens through these rocky times? Goodness knows, as a mother, I made my share of mistakes, foremost among them, communicating too little, from which I offer some observations that may be of use to others. First, here's a reality check. Your generation, whatever age you are, did not invent sex. And you probably thought about it whether or not anyone has told you about it. Yet we expect our teenagers, our teenagers, hormones raging and on the threshold of adulthood to ignore the sexual side of their humanity. Did you at that age? Second reality check. When young people are confronted by these powerful feelings and desires but are not given a strong base of knowledge and values that form a context about what saying yes means and what saying no means and what constitutes appropriate behavior, well, it stands to reason that some young women will engage in behavior that will not be in their best interest. And even the teenagers who do abstain in their teen years will eventually need these skills. The average person today is sexually active for nine years before marrying in their mid to late twenties. Third reality check. Ignorance is not bliss, but if facts alone aren't enough to get teens across the, the, the maturation rubicon. Context is all important, including practicing decision-making skills being and feeling valued by parents, but also by society, and having solid relationships with responsible adults. Fourth reality check. Even when we talk to our children about sex, we rarely talk about intimacy, desire, and sexual pleasure. There's a general cultural norm reinforced by the way we talk to our children. When we do talk to them about sex and by images in the mass media, that males want sex and females want relationships. In reality, both want both and need to learn how to handle both. But they don't want what they need to handle this but they don't learn what they need to handle to this second, to this need of intimacy on the, or their desires or the experience of sexual pleasure. In a study of students and dropouts in New York City, researchers found that girl sexuality was given talk, was generally talked about in terms of victimization, violence, and morality, but rarely in terms of desire. And the study found that girl, the girls who became pregnant were not necessarily the most overtly sexual, but often those that were passive and lacking in a sense of personal and sexual self-entitlement. Many are quite conflicted about whether or not to engage in intercourse, and without a strong sense of self-worth, it is very difficult to act from conviction. Combine that with sexual ignorance and you have Caitlin's story. Have you ever been in love? Have you ever thought you were in love? I have and I think I am. I've gone to serious measures to prove my love to a boy. I've been dating this one guy for over a year. He started having, 
I'm sorry, having sex a few months ago, and now all I do is wait and worry that my period will never come. We use condoms, and my friend gave me some of her leftover packs of birth control pills. Other friends of mine say it is not safe to use another person's pills, but just to feel safe, I use them anyway. I'm so confused, and I'm so scared. I wish I had never had sex yet. I always thought I would wait in until I was married, but I gave it up to a boy who said I love you. Women of all ages tend to date men who are older. That's not so bad for a 30-year-old, but it creates a dangerous power imbalance for younger women who do not have a strong, positive self-image and the ability to embrace their own sexual power straightforwardly. From her vantage point, now as a 19-year-old, Rosario tells her story. I was 15, unsure of what I wanted, but who, who isn't at 15? One night, I decided to go out to a quinceanera. She met two brothers, both of whom were attracted to her, and took her number. I ended up talking with the younger of them, and he was 19. I fell in love with him. I'd wake, I'd wake him in the morning after being on the phone with him all night. I'd go to school and call him from the payphone, and he'd let me go to class when our two-minute warning, warning bell rang. After school, I had 15 minutes to go to my locker from one end of campus to the other and walk home and call him. He was always keeping track of me, always jealous. He made me feel desired, needed, wanted, loved. He was my first sexual experience in a relationship, and I was in love and irresponsible. Yes, this was yet another 15-year-old love with a 19-year-old, and yes, she became pregnant. She chose not to continue the pregnancy. In my case, abortion was whispered as a possibility. Yes, even in those pro, in those very pre-road days, but I wanted to have a child. It was my passive, jelly woman way of making, of taking a measure of control over my life and keeping with my idealized notion of woman. There's a unifying thread between Rosario's story and mine that happened almost two generations as hard. The shame of acknowledging sexual activity outside our parents' and society's expectations of celibacy into marriage was greater than the pain of carrying out a heart-wrenching decision alone and without parental support. I do not know how she felt, but I felt numb, vacant, and it would take many years for me to renew my sense of self as I came, as I came first to own and then to value the power of choosing. There are solutions that work to help young people avoid having to make either Rosario's decision or mine. Where there are many ways to give children opportunities to grow by making choices. 